Okay, my name is Joseph A. Jensen Sr. I'm a, re I'm a reverend, minister, ordained June, June the 9th, 2019. Okay, but this, let's get to the point. Okay, I, I'm new, I just got through watching, uh, I just spent four hours on a video and um, the phone messing, messing up, you know how it is. I'm talking, if, as long as I'm talking and you understand what I'm saying, so does the devil. I know if you believe in that. And uh, it, you can expect that everything's going to go wrong. Why? Because you're talking about it. But I'm going to talk about something that can't stop me. I'm listening to uh, William Shapner. He's got a great show, you know. The, un the unbelievable. You know what I'm saying? You can't believe this stuff. Talking about all kind, of, but what he's talking about the subject, the reason I'm making this show is because of the content, the mysteries of whether there's a God or not. But we, we believe in God. How do you can prove there's a God? Oh, and how many people know there's a God? I just wrote a book called God's Message, and I've come here to give you that God's Message. And more. I was born autistic. And started talking to God when I was three years old. Why? If you know anything about autistic children, we're very quiet. We don't bother nobody. We leave the thing. We don't like people messing with us. And then we don't like people fooling us either. We, we, we listen to everybody who says uh, we're, 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 we're computing this shit up in our heads. And Bible stories don't add up. They don't add up to what they're saying. First thing I'll ask my, uh, my parents, pastors, even God, where are you? Why'd you let that happen? If you could have done something about it, why didn't you? Where's heaven? I don't. How come I can't see you? How come there's a devil? Why didn't you just kill this devil? Why is he here on this earth? Why we share the same planet? He's free to roam free and clean. As we as we grew, we uh, our questions to God. And our parents and them become more complicated. Einstein was a autistic retarded too. He tried to show others by his calculations. He never went through kindergarten. He dropped out the first day. You know? But he had to show others by, by, by writing down formulas that he wasn't stupid. I wasn't either, I guess. You know, I, I, I don't know. I don't think I'm stupid. But I know enough that God give me several, you know, I got a dozen books. I got four published and got dozens of books and all, every one of them was given to me by God. How do I know? Because of the way I wrote. A retarded kid doesn't write like I wrote. The stories that I wrote, the imagination that I wrote, everything was given to me by God. He doesn't have to, I don't have to prove myself to God to you. I, I, I know that I don't take credit for anything in my life. Not my writing. Not my work. I never had to search for work all my life. 35 years of running cranes and rigging. I never had to look for a job. They told me where to go next. Worked all over this country. Worked in different countries. First place I ever went out of, you know, besides the service, was Scotland. To work on a, on a dry dock. I spent six months over there in Scotland, enjoyed the dickens out of it. I've done the, I've been to like 19 different nuclear plants and did 20, uh, 29 or 28, 29, eight or 29 shutdowns. If you know, just the, the last eight years I spent with Westinghouse changing reactor heads. I was either the crane operator or overhead crane operator, or I was called the heavy, the representative for Westinghouse, changing 
who sings. Okay? I don't know. And I went to Iraq as a small crane operator. It was only a 70 some mobile crane, T-Rex. Two years there. Every place I ever went, I didn't find the job. God led me to the job. They were my, given to me. It's part of the adventure. Here's the thing, people. I'm a, I listen to William Shampter saying, and he's, he's pointing it out something that's near to my heart. They can't believe something. It's, it's, it's common sense. We all have DNA. God's message to me. We had an argument. We have arguments all my life with the God. Of course, you know I'll call God out. He's also my best friend. I mean, he's closer to me than my brother. He's better. He's closer to my father, mother, sister, brother. He's with me all the time. So, he's in my head. He's in everybody's head. From conception. You got DNA in you, he's in you. He's in the animals, with the living animal. Tree, everything. He's in the, them. God goes hand in hand with life. When you're conceived, read Psalms 139. David wrote, He knew your, knew your parents when they made you in secret. He knows the next word that's going to come out your mouth. He knows everything about you. You can't hide from God. Why? Because when you're conceived, you got a physical conception between you and your, you and your, your, your mom and your dad. We are, our identities are made by them and only them, not by our grandparents, not by our ancestors, because my parents are, are the sum of whatever created them. We are the sum of our parents. We can't become a moose, an animal, animal, can't Michael Jackson, Michael Jordan, Michael, you know, Elvis Presley. We, can't, we are not re reincarnated. We are living in our children, our blood. If you can understand this, I just said it's through, had four hours recording that they just got scrambled found out i was recording for almost an hour without without anything so i'm doing this over not touching it hopefully this will make it through as long as i get the point over our dna it contains our is our bloodline god is not in our blood he's in our brain a spirit that enters us with our parents goes to our brain the blood supplies the brain the brain uses more blood than anything else god cannot get close to our blood if it's polluted yes it's, it gets polluted by living in cities it gets polluted by living uh believing in man well, believe in man can go, go to believing in the Torah, believing in the Bible, believing in the Quran. Why? Because we're special. We're the ones. We're the ones that know the answers. We're the ones that are saved. So they make themselves country clubs. Oh, we got the answers. Everybody else is going to hell. Hell is a relative term. I've lived in hell. I've been through hell in my life. You have too. Heaven is a relative term. The relative term means living. Jesus said, No one shall enter the kingdom of heaven, lest he be born again. For, okay? What's he mean? He also said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not. For such is the kingdom of heaven. For such is the kingdom of heaven. Think about that. It's the kingdom of living. So the kids are living. Suffer little children come unto me, for such is the living in, he in heaven. Those living in heaven. Where's heaven? Heaven's here on earth. It's in us. We are the living. When we die, we're still living in them. We don't die. Our bodies die. But we're still living in our blood. Our brothers, our sisters, our, our children, anybody that's died, we're living in them already. Right now, look at your children. You're living in them. They can feel, they can see, they can hear. You know, I'm in my children. I can feel, I can see, I can hear, I taste. I don't realize it. 
but I can't, uh, but I'm going through every experience with them because the blood feels, it hears, it sees, it senses. It's in, it goes through your nose, it goes through your eyes, it goes through your ears. Blood goes everywhere. All your senses, you can't feel without blood. You can't see without blood. You can't taste without blood. You can't smell without blood. Think about it. So the blood has all the senses. But the what's inside the blood is you. And you still have a say. Even though you, you don't think you got a say, you got your memories. Your separate memories because you lived an adventure with God. From the day you was conceived, you started your adventure with God. And it's different. Nobody knows you. God is the only one that knows you. Not even Jesus Christ knows you. Because Jesus was in the blood. He wasn't experiencing what you thought, what you knew, which he's holding back in your head. Your feet, those kind of things are hidden. They're in spirit, spirit, spirit between you and them. So the soul of God and you are together throughout life. They share each other. You go on an adventure. God does not want to be a, a multitasker or a uh, or to how do you say micromanage your life. He won't tell you exactly what to do. He'd rather follow the adventure. The adventure because he's got to live forever. Ever is a long time. Let me tell you how long forever is. Forever is the universe. Why is it so big? Why is it so many planets? So why is it so enormous? That's a contingency. If we fail... <coughs> Oh, pardon me, I'm sick. If we fail, God can put an atmosphere on any one of those planets. But he'll choose the best one candidate. And he'll start over. Can we extinct ourselves? Oh, yes, we can. We've been doing it. We've been doing it. We had abortions. We had homosexuals, transsexuals, transgenders. You know, everybody too busy to have children, don't want children. In any case, we didn't have children. You were going to become extinct, don't have children. Because if you don't, guess what? There's nobody looking back at you in your bloodline. If there's nobody looking back at you, there's nobody to be born again in. Does that make sense? When you die, you're going to be born again. You're in the living. Can the man, Nicodemus said, can the man enter his womb for a second time? Yes, sir, he can. Jesus tried to explain it. Lest you be born again of the Spirit. What's it mean? God's got to be with you. God is living in you. When you go into your children, if your children are starving, they're cold, they're hungry, they're, they're living in the streets, they're eating garbage. And you kicked them out earlier and you don't know what the heck they have. Guess what? So when you die, you're going to find out where they're at. You're gonna, anybody in your bloodline, you're going to find out. What, you're going to find out where the coldest one is and the most miserable one is. Because you're going to feel, see, you're, that blood's going to feel, see, hear, see, see, and taste everything that they go through. Am I making any kind of sense here? William Shepner is talking about a girl that's 10 years old. All of a sudden, she, she, she got interested in Egypt. She went there. She fell in love. She just imagined. She started writing hieroglyphics, and nobody can understand why. That's because inside her, in her bloodline, are ancestors that go all the way back throughout time. One of them took time to focus on. They found somebody that... that was interested in, in this one, and this one started talking to her and to, giving their imagination. Our parents are always talking to us. If our, 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 our grandparents, they're telling us their stories. They help us wake up. They get us up in the morning. They put us to bed at night. We all, whether we go to school one day or another or not, it makes no difference. We know what to do the next day instinctively. Why? Because they've been talking to us. We only get rest when we go into a REM sleep. Then we got to paralyze. Then we'll paralyze ourselves so we don't hurt ourselves, except for sleep operations. But that's a whole different story. But the thing about it is, I told you I'm autistic, and so all my life I've been in libraries. I've been in, you know, I had three three eighty six computers, four forty five. So I, 
Commodores, E-Machines, uh, XPs. I've had all kinds of computers, okay? We're always digging. <clears throat> we're not digging. God leads us. Whatever we're interested in, God will lead us to our answers. Now, if God gives us something that we can't find answers, well, does that mean it's wrong? That means we can't prove it to the world we're wrong, but we know it's common sense. <laughs> I'd rather take God's common sense. Let me give you an example. God gave me this, told me one time, like, like maybe two years ago, Joe, look up a clima. Uh, just look up a clima. I look up a clima. I, I find out something. She's not mentioning the Bible or Torah. Turns out that Cain and Abel had a Cain had a had a twin a twin sister named Aklima. She's also called Kabbalah or something else, but another thing, but Aklima. Twin sister Cain. They say she wasn't the wife of Abel. As they grew up together, nobody else to mess with. Abel, even though he's the younger brother, he abused the Klima. He abused her. You know, it wasn't a nice thing because he kind of forced himself on her since she was a little kid. Okay? And guess what God's telling me, and I can't prove it wrong, but it's common sense because I'm going to finish the story. He was abusing her all her life. Cain didn't know about it. You know, don't, don't you tell your brother this. Don't you tell your brother that. He, he's doing stuff to her. Wasn't married to her. Wasn't happy. She wasn't happy with the deal. She hated. She kind of hated Abel. But she, they say he's a wife. Why did they say it was a wife? They didn't have any kids. So they could. she couldn't have been really mature because there was no kids. Okay? Otherwise there would have been kids. But there was no kids, so it was before she was mature. So you really don't take a wife before you mature, unless you have kids. You know, kids are the proof that you matured. So it was before then. They say it was over sacrifices. No, it wasn't over sacrifice. God says either Cain walked up on Abel abusing his sister, or Abel had the nerve to do it and abuse his sister in front of him. He killed him and he could have killed him 20 times over. God says, his blood's calling call, call for me out, out from the ground. What'd you do? I'm not my brother's keeper. I don't want to talk about it. He was still mad in his voice, in the wording. He's still mad. He could have killed him again and again. God knew it. God didn't kill uh, Cain. He said, Cursed be the ground that you walk on. It'll bear you nothing but thistles and thorns from this day on. Wherever you stop. Right? Go east. Aklima says, Tell that to, to her. She, go, she, won't, she wants to come with me. She won't leave me. Now, she was abused, uh, happy with Abel. Why would she want to go with Cain? They killed him. Now, she went, said, I'll have his children. I'm going to be with him. No matter what you do to him, I'll be his comfort. When he comes home after a hard day's work, I'm going to, I'm going to be there for him. I'm going to have his kids. I'm going to be with my brother. He saved me. Read the word between the lines. He saved me. From, uh, from him. He's the monster. Cain says, send her back to, to Adam and Eve. Send her back to mom and dad. Make her go. Don't let, uh, you know, I can bear my punishment. That's fine. But don't let her, her die uh, uh, and be left alone. Uh, if, I, if I get killed or something happens to me, I'd say it's not right. Well, God marked him black. He gave him a widened nose. 
He gave him black skin. Partly to discourage her from, Aklima, from going with him. But because he's going to need it where he's going. Okay? He says, I'm, I, I give you the black skin as a sign that nobody hurts you or helps you. He had to make sure that Cain never got hurt. Even the animals knew. Reptiles knew. Don't mess with Cain or her. He are under God's protection. Because if something happened to Cain, it happened to her. If something happened to her, it happened. You know what I'm saying? He couldn't let that happen because Aklima was never to blame for this. She was a victim, and now would she be a victim again? God couldn't allow two injustices to happen. So he protected both of them. But he told them, don't stop. For God's sakes, don't stop. Well, they had it pretty rough at the beginning because they had to cross Iran. They had to cross Iran. But it was a short distance in, 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 in retrospect. Because they were soon at the Indian Ocean. The Indian Ocean. It follows around the Indonesia, Taiwan, you know, Thailand. Guess what? They're at the coast. They're in the ocean. What's that mean? That means they get cooled off. That means they can go swim. They got shellfish they got crabs they got clams they got oysters they got all kinds of stuff to eat they can swim they get cooled off they swim in the ocean they get fish they get sea and, uh, urchins they get anything they want you see they, they can stay fed they're not stopping right fresh water flows to the ocean from rivers all the way along they get fresh water from they, but they can't stop. They know when they stop, it's going to turn into a disaster. The curse will take place. So they follow the ocean. They follow the Indian Ocean. Well, then it was a land bridge. There was no separation between Thailand and Indonesia, India. You know what I'm saying? It was all one landmass. From Iran, you know, Iran's bordered with India. And that's why they were able to go from one one good good situation, you know, bad situation to a good situation, where there was plenty. But they couldn't take and stop at a, at a at a waterfall and make a paradise. They couldn't stop. Why didn't they? Ask yourself, why didn't they? The, they were in, in in Indonesia. They were in uh, India. Why didn't they stop at at at, a, at the first waterfall in fresh water? They could have. Furthermore, why didn't they have kids? They didn't have kids. They're still young. You see what I'm saying? They couldn't have been mess with, messing with each other. They didn't have kids. So they followed the, the water. They followed it all the way east. If you follow the Indian Ocean east, the furthest point is Queensland, Australia. Queensland, Australia. Then it stops and you got to head north. You can't go any more first, uh, further east than Queensland, Australia. Southeast, that is, but you know, it's still east. Following the ocean, they would have followed the ocean. They couldn't have gone inland. You know what I'm saying? They had to follow the, the water source. Where's the water source? They had to stay cool. They had to have something to eat. They, they, it's common sense. So they end up in Queensland, Australia. What's in Queensland, Australia? Thistles and thorns. Clay soil. They found a cave. The cave was full. Uh, um, they had close to the ocean. They found the cave. But Cain still had to find fresh water. It's a cursed land. He had to go out every day to find water. And it wasn't on top of the ground. It was in roots. It was in things that he had to dig up. He had to find water where he could find it. 
and bring it back to, to Klima. Every day he had to get whatever water he could. Believe me, she was drinking when it when they come back. I don't know they, they if they knew, I don't think they knew how to distill back in those days. You know, salt water to fresh. So, and there was certainly was no like waterfalls in Australia. Otherwise, the ground wouldn't be like looking like that. There was thistles and thorns, just like it is today. Well, guess what? God told me, he says, I, 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 I look at all this stuff in the, up, up and everything and everything like that. And, it, and it, there was a claim I had. Wikipedia will tell you a lot of this story. But she had a ch their child, Enoch. She had twins. They were twins. They had twins. Their twins were Enoch and Awan. Common sense will tell you. And common sense told told the Klima, "Hey, they're gonna they gotta grow up together. There's nobody else to play with." But they played with each other. They are too, too close. They're gonna be too close, and she's gonna have. They're gonna have a kid one day. And it's not gonna be. They're not gonna like be twenty one either, you know. Because they're messing with each other all the time. They're inseparable. So what happens? Awan and Enoch are inseparable. As soon as she sees a teenager, as soon as she matures, she gets pregnant. She doesn't know what's going on. She doesn't ever heard of something saying. She knows it was first off she she would have started to ministrate and had to, her mama had to explain that to him. Not just to, to claim him, but she had to explain that the Enoch well that was they think she's bleeding to death. You know? She had to explain the whole nine yards. Then, she might not have explained about the kids yet. She had explained just, the, you know, about her having to go, go through this every month. But then when she stopped bleeding, that was another problem. Mom. And it wasn't just the Klima coming. That was Enoch too. Hey, Mom, something's wrong. She's not bleeding. What's going on? Okay, Mom knows. She's going to have a kid. Yeah, she's going to have a kid. And what's that kid's name going to be? Hey, Red, why? What's that mean? Mom knew. She knew. Hey, Red. Don't tell Dad. Please don't tell Dad. He, he's got enough on his mind. He's got to find this water every day. I don't know. Just not bother Dad with this. Keep it hidden. I clean him. You know, he comes home every day with the water. Maybe, maybe some other kind of food, too. Maybe a little bit of kangaroo or lizard, whatever. He's an aborigine, okay? Put it that way. Guess what, Ewan, uh, guess what um, Enoch would have looked like in A1? They might have been Aborigines uh, uh, mixes with blonde hair, blue eyes. Guess what Aborigines do? They could have been green eyes and red hair. You know what I'm saying? They're cute. They're very cute. Kind of look like uh, uh, a mixture between white and black. You know? But they definitely got a big white nose and stuff. They're, kinda, they're really cute looking. They, they're beautiful. They're, they're not just cute. They're beautiful. I could, I mean, I, I was in love with the Aborigines before God told me this. You know what I'm saying? They're just lovable people. And why are they lovable? They could leave Australia, but they want it because that's their roots. They know what's going on. They're keeping this hidden because why would they going to get involved with the world? The world is corrupt, mean, nasty. It doesn't know squat. They know everything. Okay? So this is what's going on. They have pure minds. They know what, for the beginning of time, we don't know the beginning of time. They know what happened. They know what it's all about. They know that their moms and dads, they can, the reason they know so much, the day Avred was born, you know, I, Aklima had to warm 
can't it what if you had grandchildren you know it's gonna happen someday you know it's gonna happen someday we'll worry about that then i gotta go get water now you know well that day happened Marcy Klima had the midwife, A1, the born A grade, clean her up, clean him up, and takes him to Cain. Hey, meet your grandson. She hands him A red. Cain with a, has A red in his hands. He says, Oh my God. He takes him outside, he lifts him up to God. Check him out, God. Thank you. This is my grandson. Hey. At noontime, he's putting him in his nose. He's smelling him. Smell him, God. Hey, I smell him. Oh. At night, he's still holding him up. You know why? Because he made the drawing in the paintings, the rock paintings. Yeah, he's holding it right up in, in the morning when the sun's rising. He has him to his nose in the afternoon. At night, he's still holding him up. God, God get came, give, left the evidence. There's another picture. The thing is, the cave drawing too. It's a family, a set of twins, Cain and Klima, with another set of twins, A1 and Enoch, holding a red. They might be stick figures, but God told me, you go, you go and see it. I will, I, will, I hope I do before I die. It's on my bucket list. This is on my first, first thing I'll do. I go to Australia. He says, you don't have to worry. They're going to take me to that, that cave because this word is going to get out. Those cave dwell markings in Australia date back 100,000 years. The one in Indonesia that you're going to find in the books goes back 40,000 years. The some in Iraq go back 45,000 years. Okay? India, 60,000. Figure it out. Australia has the oldest, is the oldest country. It is the land of Nod. It's the beginning. Why is it black skin? Okay, so to protect them a sign don't mess with them leave them alone don't help necessarily help them you're not going to help them anyway because they don't need it they know they, they're survivors they're also the most pure-hearted people on the earth you can't get any purer than that but now let's get to purity there's a lot of pure people in this world the pure lives, Indians, Eskimos, a lot of cultures, people in the Amazon, pure cultures. They never had an evil thought. I don't know. Your blood running through you runs runs pure till you corrupt it. You want to call it sin, call it sin. Sin's a word, okay? Our life, if our, we live towards the cities we are, are, uh, and stuff, and we live to, uh, sucking this stuff up, it becomes polluted. Jesus is in the, when you accept Jesus, he becomes the filter. God couldn't get, get close to the blood running through the brain when it's polluted. He never gets close to anything in the brain that's polluted. He can't get close to it. It disgusts him. With polluted, uh, our blood's polluted, he's not going to get close to it. But he's always been close to the people that's had pure blood. God's, they've known about God. God's hugged them because he's up there hugging the blood. It's just going through them all the time. He can hug you. He doesn't have to run from it. God runs from the, the, the blood when it's polluted. He runs away from it. He can't stand it. That's why Jesus came about, to purify the blood. Purify the blood. Does it sound familiar? He wrote about it for God's sake, or told about it. He comes there to purify the blood, to hide your sins. Wash them away. Wash your sins away. Clean your blood. 
That sounds familiar, doesn't it? It makes sense, doesn't it? It runs to the brain. Now God can hug you. And then God does. What's the evidence? Evidence is the Holy Spirit comes into you, gives you the hug. The Holy Spirit now can hug you because you're pure. The fullness of the Holy Spirit can come to you because you got your, your sins are washed away. Your blood is pure. But that doesn't mean he didn't exist already in a whole lot of people that live pure lives. Even the Muslims. Muslims. I'll explain this in a little bit because that's where I went four hours explaining this. But Muslims believe even a bad thought, because God's up there. He knows your every thought. He knows the next word coming into your mouth. Even your thought, a bad thought, you risk separation from God. Okay? So Muslims can't drink alcohol. They can't have a bad thought. The heck with it. Let me just go into this story. You know about the story I haven't told you with a Klima, a one, a red, and the trade drawings. How much different is that? And how much more believable is that than the sacrifices and the stuff that you read about? I'll tell you another one for these people. Because this is what, what God just left me. I'm just talking. God's leading me. So this is his program. God led me. Off to talk about the Quran. Muhammad was 49 years old. 49 years old when he went to the, the cave called Hira. Now before Muhammad grew up in a culture with had 360 gods for a reason. There's 360 days in a year. There's 12 months in a the season. There's 12 tribes, right? Arab tribes. Okay? There's 90 days... In a season. Algebra. That you're thinking about. 12 months. 360. 90, 90, 90. 90 in a season. 490 degree angles make up a circle. 360 degrees. 490 degrees. Make up a square. 490 degrees make up a rectangle. Why would our... 300, where does 365 or 362 fit into that calculation? Doesn't. Man's kind of put his own two cents worth in. Algebra wasn't devised by the Arabians. They, they found it out. Oh, well, let's say it's through Enoch. Enoch wasn't the inventor of algebra. He was a thief of algebra. Enoch's parents. And God, now he's going to say, he's going to tell me about the Noah now. Okay, well, let's talk about Noah first. Okay. Jared was the brother of Seth, younger brother. Seth was born first. Jared was second. Jared watched the stars. He was an astronomer. He, a word for astronomer is called Chaldean. Chaldean. That's important. He was an astronomer. He drew star charts. Every, the whole galaxy as he could see it, the planets, the orbits, the sun, the moon, the rising, and everything. He had everything in his charts. He amazing astronomer, making star charts. He stayed 175 years by himself before he knew about a wife. Then he took a wife. Baraka. Baraka. Now, B R A A K A, whatever. You know what I'm saying? Baraka. It's not mentioned in the Bible. Baraka. Jared married Baraka. Maybe it does. But anyway, she was a calculus and she looked at his drawings carefully. She fell in love with them because she fell in love with the star charts. My God, what do you got here? What? There's 12 days in a month. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, 12 d days in a year. She got it down to the, to the minutes. There's 60 minutes an hour. There's 24 hours in a the day. There's 12 hours in a the night. There's 12 hours in, in, the, in the day. 
There's 25, 24 years. There's 30 days in a cycle. It's all here. She she wrote the calculations that the Arabic's taking credit for. Enoch took credit for. First, Enoch, when he wrote his books, Enoch 1 and 2. Oh, my God. Whether any of that is, is true or if it's BS, he stole it from, it was his imagination against his own parents. He never mentions his dad, Jared. And he called his wife, his mother, Bear Akil, as an angel, one of the angels, the fallen angels that left heaven that taught him the calculus. <clears throat> She's the, she was the Chaldean, the astronomer. That's why I said the name's important. <clears throat> she called her name Barakil. He called her name Barakil. He called, he never mentioned his parents because he wanted everybody to believe he was an angel himself. <clears throat> he was also a Horite. Though he, meaning that it was all right for the angel, according to him, the angels bred with the women. They liked them. And they had all kinds of monsters and giants and different things. And some of them ate flesh and were cannibalistic and they had to feed them. So some of them were 3,000 foot tall, over 3,000 foot tall, which is, you know, it says 3,000 uh, L in, in his book. Well, an L is from the elbow to the fingertips. That's an L. And you can't just, that's actually about a mile high. You know, if you got to believe that kind of stuff, in the Bible, they wrote it about calling them the sons of God that were giants and stuff. Doesn't matter what they wrote. Doesn't matter what the Quran wrote, what the Torah wrote, or the Bible wrote. I'm going to tell you why. God came back 6,000 years and gave me a message called God's message to get to the whole world, the entire world. It took him 6,000 years before he could deliver this message. Because I'm, I'm giving this message on an iPhone. We got smartphones. We got 5G. All of it had to be necessary to get a message to, to the world, not to your country clubs, not to your religions, not to your groups. Not to stop here, any point, because we all have DNA. So the message has to get to everybody. Okay, so he gives it to me. I'm in an argument with God. I don't know why. I'm, 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 I'm 69 years old. 68 at that time. And I say, I get in an argument with God. I don't even know what it was about. But, you know, God and I have had our arguments over time. I don't even know what it's about, but like I said, God said, Joe, like I told you, I'm an autistic kid. Joe, quit quit blaming me. I don't have any hands to help you or stop you or anyone. I can't help anyone. I can't stop anyone. I couldn't save you from a fire or put one out. I can't call 911 or yell stop. Right then I knew we were always to blame. I was to blame. You was to blame. We let this world become what it is. Not even Satan's done the things we blame him for is what God said. We done it. We did make this world what it is. We quit having children. I told you the children live in your DNA. We're killing ourselves. We can become extinct. And when we extinct, God's extinct. Because they can't be born again. You know what they'd be born into. We just ended our dog. We just became extinct just like any a goonie bird. You know, we can't. We continue on this path. This is The earth is a, it's an experiment. It's an experiment. If we fail, guess what? There's an eternity out there. For God to start over and try again. But he doesn't want to start again. He wants us to succeed. He doesn't want us leaving our churches. He just wants to let everybody to accept God. And bring him into the church. 
and understand there's been mistakes made, but that's okay. As long as we get, got a chance to accept that God into the churches, and especially the preachers that preach and teach that they know it all, and they went to seminary and they got their doctors and everything else like that, they have to accept the fact that they could have been wrong about a lot of things and let God into them. The people got to become the hands, the feet, the mouth of God. That's all he's asking. Everybody to become the hands, the feet, and mouth of God. I'm going to tell you how that's going to be done, too. And you can't, nobody can stop it. Well, I mean, they could try, but I don't doubt it's going to happen. Because God gave me this message. It's not that hard. It's not rocket science. Okay. What I'm saying, we all got to recognize we have DNA and it's living. We're not dead. We're not. We're already alive in everybody in our bloodline, wherever it's gone. And we're going to live, and we're going to feel, and we're going to see. Because the blood runs, like I said, blood runs to everybody's eyes. It runs through their mouth. It runs through their ears. It runs through their fingertips. So you're going to feel it. And you're also going to carry your memories because you have your own memories. And you're going to transfer it all the time. You don't have to go, your kids don't have to go to school, you know, one second. To know what to do the next day. The parents are going, you know, everybody inside them has been talking to them until they finally get REM slip. I think I mentioned all that. Okay, so now, the point of the matter is, is I wrote this book, God's Message. Because it has to get to the world. It had, I, I opened the store on Amazon. I published it myself too, and I I'm on my, got my own printer. You know? I got my own printer. I've got my own publisher. I could get my own um, copyrights, ISBN numbers. That's no problem. First two books I ever did, though, I, I had them done by the person, and believe it, there's a, the books are not a failure, but they they didn't sell one thing. I bought every book I had. I probably sold a couple dozen books. I, I bought them all back, and they're pretty expensive books. Okay. The point of the matter is, God's message, God got me where I could publish and print my own book called God's Message. And it's only 29 pages long. But I opened the store at Amazon. It took took almost uh, a half a year to get that store open. Over over seven months to get it, uh, to get the store open. Why? Because of the, they couldn't understand the category it would never have been published before in the ISBN numbers and stuff like that. They couldn't get there. To, it, it grasped the idea. Was it a religious book? Was it this or that? You know, they, they had to decide. Whatever the reason they have. I can tell you the reason. Two people don't want this book out. Religions and Satan. And the cronies. Okay? They're going down. Every government's going down by this message. It's going to be taken down when everybody receives this message. Doesn't want anybody leaving their church. They just want good churches to accept God, and they might have been making mistakes. There might be mistakes in the Bible. There might be even mistakes there, there in the Quran. There might be mistakes to think. You got to know it's man written by man. Man, God comes back and tells us about DNA. And we've been having abortions and we've been murdering since the beginning of time. And every innocent child can't have been born in sin. As what's written. Two parents saved. They have a child. Is, a child, is, he, is he really saved if the child's born in sin? No, it's not, that's not salvation. It's screwed up. They can't... They've made so many mistakes... That once it pointed out, you'll see how many more that they make. It's like a rolling ball of mistakes. Once you point out one, they you start looking for the other, and then all of a sudden, boom! It's 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 a, it's a, a thing of worms, right? All of them. God could never have condoned killing from the very start, because when you kill, you are destroying the DNA, the lifeblood of Him, of God, and and us. 
If we have no putty to be born again in, we can't live no more. Neither can God live no more. He can't be the host. Nor do we have anybody to be the host in. Does that make sense? Common sense. So God could have never condoned killing. All through the Bible, the Torah, the Quran, there's been killing. Joshua, con considered a hero. He's the one that wanted to go into the land of Melchizedek honey and take it. It was God promised it to us. It's ours. He was a murderer. He was a hero. I don't know if the if if, if, if Moses was. I don't know. Could have been. But he wasn't the one that crossed the Jordan River uh, trying to steal the land of Melchizedek honey. Okay. <clears throat> When Samuel told Saul to commit genocide, then he goes back with cows and, or, you know, cattle and things like that, right? Uh, they hear it. Samuel hears it and says, you didn't do what I told you. You're going to lose your cannon. Was that, who was telling him what to do? Was it God? Of course not. God would never have told Samuel to commit genocide on nobody. They had to justify it. They had to wipe that place out because they were in their way. The Catholic religion. They, com they, they, they committed more genocides on more people and murdered more people than all the religions combined in the world. Islamics, uh, uh, Jews, everybody. And, it's just a, and they justified themselves by that. Paul in the Bible. He was a murderer. He murdered Jews as a tax collector. He didn't mind how he did it himself because he he told his, his soldiers, kill them. They don't have our tax money. No thought. Well, the proof. See, there's a lot of things I can tell you about Paul. But you, when he talked to the Colossians, the Thesians, the Theologians, and the Philippians, and, you know, all these people, these four groups. He talks with authority like he's Jesus Christ himself. He was never with Jesus Christ. He wasn't an apostle. He's never with Jesus Christ. But he says he was knocked down and flashed um, before his eyes. And that man was so polluted that his God couldn't have never got close to him. God doesn't get close to people that have polluted minds. And Jesus would have never gone into his heart saying things like, one of the gifts of, of, the, of God and Jesus Christ was speaking in tongues. I pray in tongues, have ever since I got it. 40 years ago. Why do I speak in tongues? Why does God, because God already knows what I'm going to say. He knows what's in my heart. But he doesn't want me expressing it out loud. Why? Because everybody's listening. The cronies. Satan's cronies. He doesn't want your neighbors to know it and everybody to know it. You know why? Because it's getting out there. It's broadcasting to the people that don't need to hear it. That are looking to, to stop whatever you're talking about. If you're talking about a person's having trouble, you think they're going to get more money or getting help? No, you just broadcast the thing where they doubt they're going to get any help. Sickness, anything. You're... A human broadcaster. Hey, he ain't got no money. How much? Well, yeah, good for him. I ain't got none either. You know, you don't do that. So God invented tongues because we can't keep our mouth shut, shut. It's not necessarily so much a gift because anybody could sit there and babble like a turkey is better than broadcasting out the real your real concerns. Do you understand? Keep it to yourself. Why? Or speak in tongues. Why? Because tongues, they don't, Satan or anybody else doesn't need to know what you, your concerns. God knows your concerns. He knows what's in your heart. So it's not a language to be interpreted like Paul wants. He wants to interpret it. He wants to understand every word. Unless it be like barbarians speaking unto somebody like barbarians. He'd rather speak one word of understanding than 10,000 words of barbarian. Opposite. Oh, the whole thing about tongues. It was never meant to be interpreted. It's to keep the devil from figuring out what you're... 
and the, and the people don't need to know what's going on so they can stop you. If that doesn't make sense, nothing will make sense in this broadcast. That's what tongues is all about. That's why when you read the Bible with understanding, when you're close to God, God tells you exactly how he feels. And I can tell you how he feels about Paul. He hates everything Paul wrote, acts everything. Because all it is is stolen information that puts himself on a pedestal and made up to put him looking like he was Jesus Christ himself. So for all those Bible scholars and people that went to seminary, prove me wrong. Prove God wrong. When I say that God's in your DNA and he, there is no heaven, heaven is is heaven and hell are relative terms. I've been through hell in this life and I've lived in hell. It's here on earth. The living have gone through hell and they lived in hell. As far as heaven goes, heaven means living. Jesus said, let the children come unto me and forbid them not. For such is the kingdom of heaven. So such are living. Lest ye be born again. You shall not enter the kingdom of the living. Lest you have a, somebody living to be born into. You can't live in the, in, in the kingdom of the living. Heaven. Well, we, so heaven's a relative term. It's kind of like reality. There is no reality. Reality is what the choice that you made at that time. You could have done, gone a billion different other ways, but you, you chose that one path. That's history, not, not reality. Whatever way you went and decided to go is history, not reality. And history is not really reality. It's reality of what you did. But reality is not what's going to always happen. You, well, you know, history's doomed to repeat itself. Only if you make that your reality. You got a billion other choices. Okay, just like this. This message that God's given you. I'm going to tell you, because God's leading me, leading me on to this. I can tell you the story right now of, of Noah. I can tell you the story about Muhammad. But God's telling me I did that for four hours there and, and get on with the point. <clears throat> <clears throat> My ministry is called God's Living Ministry. I'm going to tell you this, a big story about Muhammad. I'm going to tell you a big story about Noah. All of them make sense, and they common sense, and everything. Like I just told you, the, the, the common sense story of Cain and Abel. Okay? I got four books published my own self. None of them were written by me. I don't get to take myself credit for nothing. I live in a house that I'm still working on now. That is... And as far as I'm concerned, it's God's house. Okay, God, I I, I got to catch up with God. It's a, a custom home. It's got three bedrooms. Every one of the bedrooms have a full full bath. Then it's got a half bath for a laundry. Okay, so three and a half baths. Who wouldn't want their own bedroom a full bath? Did I just figure that out? God figured that out. The base of this house is only twenty four by thirty. Yet I got a, a street story. But anyway, let's get off my house. God, nothing I wrote, nothing I built, I take credit for. It's always been God. And those inside me. I give credit to all of them, but not me. I'm only the, the messenger. You are the ones that are listening to this, this, this broadcast. This message is meant for you. You're the ones that are special. Everyone and every person is unique, special to your mother, father. You can't be your your mother, father. You, you couldn't be a a Michael Jackson, Michael Jordan, uh, Elvis Presley, a, a bird, a, a anything. You're not reincarnated into nothing that you want to be. You're reincarnated to whatever your parents put together. You're unique only to them, not to your grandparents or anybody in history. That, then let's get down to the, what God's saying. Get on with it. Here's the point. In God's message, it's not just a message to tell you that we're all alive through our DNA. 
And we all got to become the hands, the feet, and the mouth of God. That's a simple, right? How do you do that? I'll tell you how. You're already in the rapture when the book come out in February. Okay? Forget about heaven. You're in the rapture. You're in the test. This is the test that God set before every person there is. This is God's living ministry, not mine. Okay? God's living. He's living with this ministry through me. Okay? But it's not mine. God wants everybody. Listen to what I'm going to say. God wants everybody that's smart enough to get two index cards, two in the blank index cards from the store. Put your name on it. Put your fingerprint on it. Do it on the other card. Sign it. Put your birth date on it. Put your name, your birth date, and your fingerprint on it. Put your name, fingerprint, birth date on that one. Don't do nothing else except for mail one of them into the God's living ministry. Put the other one in a safety deposit box and don't let nobody get hold of it. Don't ever let nobody get hold of it. Your fingerprint, your name, your birthday, all in a, in a row, identifies you better than any social security number, than any password, than anything you could ever have. Okay? Soon we're going to be voting by these here iPhones with facial recognition. That's better than anything. From our homes. Everywhere in the world. Why? Because everybody that comes and registers for God's living ministry is going to receive a promissory IOU. We're going to call it a God's coin. But it's going to be. Everybody that's going to register with me is going to be promised a God's coin. Okay? Everybody you sponsor earns you another God's coin. In other words, on that card, if you have a sponsor, you keep that card and you keep track of who you sponsored. Just You don't have to put their name. Just put a line. Or put their birth date down. That's better. But what I'm saying is put something on there. You can just put the line. You know, just like, you know, you're counting off scores off on a game, right? You know, put four, then slash it. it. Makes no difference how you do it. Just keep a record on your own card. When a thousand people join this ministry, God's living ministry, that means a thousand IOUs for God's coin have been issued. Those thousand are bringing uh, ten more. They can bring in a million in no time. You know what I'm saying? When there's enough God's going and God determines the time by how many by the numbers of people that joined his ministry to become the hands, the feet, and the mouth of God, you are because you already made the move. You put you put, you, 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 you you send in the cards. You to, now you're talking about God, what you did to people, and you became the feet. You got it there. You got you're the messengers now, not just me. I'm not alone. Now you sponsor somebody in. Of course, you are the hands and feet, mouth of God. That's simple. You didn't do nothing, right? And they got a God's coin, and you got a God's coin. Why? Because they joined you because they sponsored them. You got another. So how fast is it going to take to get a million? How there's. 7.7 7 billion people in this world that have to get this message. 195 countries, speaking 8,500 different languages or more. Remember, it started out with 77. Well, I, I didn't even get, you get to that. But there's the Tower of Babel, 77 different languages were started. Now there's over 8,000. The thing about it is, is what I'm trying to get to, and I can tell you the other stories later. This is the most important. This is what God says. Get on with it. 
The God's coin is a promissory note. When there's enough of them out there, enough people to join this ministry, God's living ministry. God's coin is only, only digital. It's only on paper. It's not even, you know, digital. It's analog. You know, it's on paper. It's not, it's a good, not on digital for a good reason, because that can be hacked. There's no hacking about this. I'm the holder of thousands or millions of cards. And you, my people are. I am going to tell Bitcoin. Right now, Bitcoin's worth $22,000. $22,233 or something like that. At one point, it got up to $69,000. Okay? So it doesn't stay there. Um, only a few months, uh, less than a year ago, it was at 33. Okay? Actually, up to 39. But anyway, it's not just dropped down to $22,233. Okay? Going to offer. The highest I said it was at 69000 ever. That's the highest peak of Bitcoin. God's living ministry, or me, is going to offer Bitcoin a deal. A two-for-one deal. Two God's coin for one Bitcoin. At $70,000 to $35,000. That's simple math. They're going to make one $1,000 more than they ever had before. And they get God's coin. But I ain't waiting around. The next day, they don't take the deal. Within 24 hours, it's going on the market. I'm announcing it on the market. Okay, it's worth $35,000 each. Your God promissory notes is $35,000 each. At that point, God's living ministry will buy anybody's God's coin from them. Or how many they, they, they accumulated. Why? Because it's going to skyrocket. It's going off the charts. Guess where Bitcoin's going? It's down, down, down. We will not take paper currency of any country. It will be unacceptable. It's got to be gold, silver, commodities, stocks, bonds. But it cannot be. A currency. Every country in this world has to pay its militaries. Every country in this world has to pay its employees. It has to pay everything by paper. Guess what? I don't think militaries are going to work for nothing. I don't think criminals are going to work for nothing. They have no money in it for them. They can't launder it. They can't launder a, a, a card that's not even in graphics. It's not all, not even in digital form. It can't be hacked. All to head is your fingerprint and your, your your birth date on it. And you can put as many like that. I mean, you can put your palm prints on that, that that card. I don't care what you put on that card for identity. But all I, I require is that in, in, in your word. I'm going to give you about God's coin. I'm going to give God's coins away. I'm going to give them to, to the poor. I mean, give them to the, the, the homeless. Not necessarily to the homeless. But I'm going to be giving a lot of them away. Because here's the thing. The day that every government shuts down within the first few, few seconds of opening market, banks are going to close their doors to anybody with paper currency. They're not going to, they're not going to take it. It's not going to be allowed. It's, it's too speculative. They don't know what's going to happen. Then they're going to close their door to paper currency immediately because they don't know what's going to happen. You just took, knocked the socks off this world. Guess what? Like the thief in the night. Boom. They're not going to know unless you're wait, looking and waiting. You're not going to know what happened. Boom. All of a sudden, the bottom's going to fall out of paper currency. But we got what do we got? We got their, our cell phones. We got our facial recognition. We're voters. And we say... Print, keep printing. 
but take your money, make the military give us free solar, install, print, make free solar instead of weapons, panels, have the militaries installing free solar, Wi-Fi, internet, uh, alarm systems for everybody's home for free. The military can monitor it. They can send the police. They can send the, 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 the medics. They can send the, the, the fire department to everybody's home as logistics. Just, just keeping logistics from space. They can do that. The military has the, the thing to do that from outer space. Monitor everybody's home. Give us the internet. A good internet. Not one that's messed up. Start over. Start over. You don't necessarily got to start over because God, because the people with God's coin, in order to get God's coin, we've we've invested. Everybody's turned over their stocks. Everybody's turned over their commodities. Everybody's turned over everything to get God's coins. But here's what God's going to do. God says, every person that's working is going to get a month off, free vacation, unlimited funds. I don't care if you if you if, if you go you go on vacation. If your dream is to own a mansion, you're going to get your mansion. If your thing is to get in business first and get a a, a trucker gets a a hundred a, a a two hundred thousand uh, dollar tractor trailer truck. Uh, go get it. You want uh, you two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars is what you're gonna get. Two hundred fifty thousand dollars a person or the equivalent. Every person in every country is gonna get the same in American the, the current the, the transfers, not in their currency. Okay. So, of course, the last will be first. The weakest country that's working for pennies on the dollar are going to be getting the most on the dollar. Okay? Does that make sense? The last will be first. The first will be last. The United States, is going to, they're going to be getting paid according to if they were living here in the United States. So then the other countries aren't going to be poor no more. It's leveling the, the playing field. Okay? God's coin is, is leveling the, 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 the playing field when they print the currencies. Because when they go on vacation, they, they're going to get the same vacation you are at pennies. You know, the same value, okay, for the paper money. You see, you see what I'm saying? Nobody's going to be able to go up or down on, on the prices that they already have. Be quiet because there's competition to get everybody to come to their, their cities. The city's got to clean up. But what do they got to get rid of? Well, first off, the government's going to print, un give unlimited funding to families of prisoners. Unlimited funds to families of prisoners and homeless. And give them two and a half acres in the United States or one hect, which is equal to one hectare in every, any of every country, to live on government land. On national lands. I don't care if it's in, give you an example, Yellowstone National Park. But nobody's going to live within 30 miles from around you. You're going to have your two and a half acres. You're going to have that homeless person, every family of, the, of a prisoner is going to have a film crew, a director, a producer, guides. They're going to have followers. They're going to have under, architects, designers, film, film set people. Video to, uh, teams, and they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna be on reality TV, and they're gonna go to those government lands and pick out wherever they want to live, wherever they want to live on government land, and with the film crew, and those film crews are gonna make money because it's gonna be on inter, on reality TV, which is also cost people to go to to watch, you know, it doesn't have to be much, it doesn't have to be. But they want to watch reality TV. That reality TV is going to be seen in every jailhouse. 
Every prisoner is going to be up over C. Their family on big screen TVs that are two-way monitors. And they could see their family building their, their, their dream homes, their castles, everything they want, right? Uh, they're going to be wanting to get out. They're going to be wanting to get out. Every prisoner is going to be watching that. When they talk, there's going to be two-way speakers in, in the, in the, in the uh, uh, things where when they talk, it's going to be like on Bluetooth. Nothing, they, the conversation between their husband, their, their, their families and that, when they call them every day, hey, it's like, okay, hey, how you doing? It's going to be, everybody's going to know what they say. It's not going to be like, hey, I'm gonna, I'll, get you, I'll be there next Saturday to get you out. No, it's not going to be that show. It's going to be on reality TV every single breath. Guess who else is going to see that reality TV? The people outside, criminals. They're going to want to turn themselves in so they can get on the deal. Even a murderer is going to want to turn himself in. You know why? Because murder, every person that kills is going to be executed. Why? No question about it. They're going to be executed. They, if they've been found guilty of murder, they're being executed. There's no keeping them. But they're going to be killed in the Hilton, which is going to be just like the Hilton um, Resort. The best room they ever had. They're going to get the meal, like the best meal they ever ate. No handcuffs. No way. They're going to watch whatever they want to watch. Had the best time in their life. They can even have it with their family. Okay? They can go in here at the Hilton and best day of their own life. I don't care whatever kind of murder, horrific murder they ever did. The point of the matter is they're going to die that way. And that day... When it's time time to get quiet, and that day's over, they've got to go to sleep. The family's got to get out. The mother's got to get out. Everybody's got to get out and let you go to sleep. They'll die by carbon monoxide in their sleep. Not harmful. Just fall asleep. Carbon monoxide. Simple. They won't wake up. If they had turned themselves in, they'll watch their families. They'll get they'll they'll get they'll go to back to their DNA. Otherwise, they're never going to see their DNA. For those that don't, and they're murderers, God's never going to let them get close to their DNA. He'll throw them to the other side. Of he he'll do he's dead. One person I know is going to make it to the, the other side of wherever galaxies there are. The other side, what so far he'll throw them so far. To, It'll never make it back to any place with a glimmer of a star or any light. And that's going to be Zing Lapine, President of China. President of China, got news for you. And everybody like you. You didn't read writing on the wall. Mean, mean, tech apart Zing. That was the writing that Daniel had, uh, Bel Belshazzar read, that Daniel had to interpret. It means... You haven't met up to God's standards. You haven't been weighed in the balances. And you don't measure up. You've been found short. You're going to lose your kingdoms. He's committed so many abortions by the one, one child rule. Every second one I'm talking right now, millions of abortions are taking place, you know. How can that be? DNA. DNA is gone. He can wipe out this world with his policy. God will throw him further than... There won't be no light where he's going. But his soul's still going to live. But it's not going to live anywhere close. But he can't get back here for nothing. Or none like him. They didn't read the writing on the wall. I just read you the writing that Balthazar, uh, Daniel wrote to Balthazar. They don't measure up. Neither will, when we vote them in, uh, get these phones, we'll vote that money to be printed again for our vacations, our, our, our one-month vacations, unlimited funds. means we'll be traveling to every city, but the city, what's well, not going to be the city? There's not going to be criminals in the city, and there's not going to be poor people in the city. 
the people with God's coin will be paying the 30% taxes or more. Uh, you know, they don't have to pay more, but 30%. Strictly on every, making every city a paradise, a place people want to go to. Attract people there for their vacations. It's competition. That's why they can't lower the, or raise the prices. I mean, they can't. They can lower the prices, but they can't raise them because of competition. Of course, they could lo lower them if they're not getting getting enough revenue. They're not getting enough attention. But the point of the matter is, they're going to get whatever they can. Every every city to be beautiful. People aren't going to stay in their own homes when you can get a home anywhere you want to get. So they're going to spread out. No more condominiums. No more hotels. No more living like groceries and things. That's where they wanted us. That's where they had us. Where they can control us. Where they could shut off our electricity at once. Shut off our water at one time. Where they could kill us at one time. Where they can be our influence like religion has on our brains. We're brainwashed people. We accept the Bible for every word it has, yet they're murderers that wrote the Bible. They're murderers that wrote the Torah. They're murderers that wrote the Quran. Religions. I got Jesus Christ. He purified my blood. But you know, I don't think God didn't have to... It, he didn't have to purify it that much because I've been close to God since I was three years old. But I still accepted Jesus in my heart. Now, just because I, I would never know the Spirit of God. Knowing the Spirit of God without Jesus, okay? The gifts, my writing, my intellect, what I can talk about now, a retarded kid. I had to go to summer schools to take algebra. They would never let me take algebra in uh, mainstream in school. It was arithmetic. I wanted to learn. The first two semesters, I went to Francis Marion College. I was working at the fire department when I went there. First two semesters, I took 18 credit hours uh, each course. That's a lot. European history, uh, the Russian Re Revolution, <laughs> uh, uh, Renaissance, the... Uh, <clears throat> German uh, algebra uh, psychology. Holy cow! When I went to psychology, when I went to back to another college later, I took, finally took some of the basics that I didn't take when I started. But I took psychology. My God, I. Autism is a pet peeve with me. And I read a paper about aut autism. I never learned to read and write. I, mean, I never learned how to read really well. But I, can't, I couldn't write good. My grammar, periods, where, where the comments go, where the separation of words, run on sentence, all that stuff. All that stuff I, I never learned all that. So I still have trouble with that. I, I, right now, I write at it like a ninth grade level. Maybe lower. Okay, but... People will still understand me. You can, you can understand an 8th grader or ninth grader. Okay? So what I'm saying is, when I took psychology and I wrote about autism, they used to, I mean, they, in the beginning, they, 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 they electrocuted us. They put us on wet, wet sheets and then put the um, electric to, to the wet sheets. Covered, they strapped us down with a wet sheet and then electrified it to shock us out of our, our dream world. Ice, everything else, tortured us. There's a story about little Amy. She picked her, mother took Amy, grabbed her up from the floor, and threw her on the couch. Yeah, yeah, throw her on the couch. Little Amy gets down and she's circling a spot on the floor. Company's there. And she's giggling and laughing in that hole, the black hole in the ground. She's giggling and laughing. What? No matter, no matter what she was seeing in that hole, in her imaginary world, get, get her up. Get her You're bothering people. Yeah. That's what they do with autistic kids. 
But anyway, we're always listening. We're always, we don't, not li paying attention. We're not uh, to you so much as we're like glassy eyed and just staring ahead. But we're absorbing everything. We see everything in a different way. We make funny stories so we remember it. Because we can, we can visualize the whole thing all over again, whatever we have going. So we, it brings back memories. And we, it, you know, I remember when Dad fell off the roof. It was comical. You know, it was like <laughs> he walked off the roof backwards. A dumb guy. He cut his finger off on the table saw. <laughs> he split his head with the axe down the middle. With the axe. <laughs> I mean, it was like comical, but it was. That's the way autistic children see it. It was funny because my dad would hop, skip, and jump like a rabbit when he got hurt. <laughs> One time we were on the thing shoveling cow manure from the back of a pickup truck and our shovels crossed the top. He had a fl flat nose shovel, I had a round nose shovel, and they crossed the top. And all of it went down my dad's back, on my dad's head and down his shirt. My dad has an expression on it. When he gets mad, you know, rolls his tongue backwards. Eyes become bloodshot instantly. I take off running. I'm a teenager. I run in my tennis shoes. He throws his flat nose shovel off the back of a pickup truck like a spear. He hits the back of my shoe and take, cuts the, the back of my, sh my the heel off my damn shoe and it sticks in the dirt. Now, a flat nose shovel doesn't stick in the dirt real easy. I didn't come back for two days. I had to call my mom the next day and she says, you better stay away another day, day or so because geez, I don't think he's cooled off yet. I mean, <laughs> that's the kind of stuff I, I, I remember. You know, it's comical. But the thing about it is, my life has been like, when I, I, I was starved for, for knowledge, when I like, got out, uh, out of, uh, uh, when I went to, I went to come back on the GI Bill, I was at the fire department, and then I got, got on the GI Bill and was able to go to college without taking the SAT. Man, I was 36 credit hours the first year. And I've got a 4 0 average. Can't get no better than that. But the fire department changed our schedule and couldn't go back. I managed to go back 20 years later, 30 years later, to another tech. Took their courses. And that's when I wrote a paper on psychology. I took psychology. Give it in English 101. Give it and told it in speech. And then turned it in for psychology. I taught the other students that. I taught the other students how to cheat. I, I got a B. Anyway, I took biology. I took physics. I took all the A's and everything. I taught people by my hand. You don't see the lines on the hand. At every joint, there was a, a date or a fact that I would write on there in ink on my hand. And I would study it for a week. Those are triggering points. Then the day of the test, I wash my hands real good. Wipe all that ink off. I take the test. Guess what? I have my hand. I look at my hand. They don't, they don't look at the blank hand. And I'm, and I'm answering the questions. Oh, yeah. It was simple. I made straight A's. Why? Because I had all the answers on my hand. They couldn't see it. Why? Because I had, for a week, I carried around all the answers on my hand. Of any question, I uh, saw on both hands. If I had one, one, I had the other one filled. Right? If you didn't have it filled, I had my elbows filled. Whatever. But I could wash them all off before I took a test. But I, but I didn't necessarily. It wasn't just me that passed this test. Those inside my DNA. Yeah, they're helping me too. Yeah, they and God. They're all with me. Come on, Joe. You know the answer to this. Come on, Joe. They're telling me the answers. I'm just not listening. You know, or I'm li I'm trying to hear. Oh, come on. Oh God. Have you anybody done that when they they're, they're trying to think? Oh, please tell me the answer. Yeah, somebody's gonna answer that question. Somebody inside you. You see what I'm saying? It's common sense, people. Yeah, you let the world think that they're gonna do the thinking for you. B.S. B.S. Everybody's adventure was with God. He wants, he doesn't like uniformity. He hates uniformity. Adventure, everybody's on their own adventure to live it to the fullest. That's why God will take, even with the people God wants, you can't save a damn cent. 
you invest it, you invent, use it to invent with, you, you invest it, or you spend it. Don't save. It'll be like the manna from heaven. God's not going to let anybody save. There's not going to be such thing as banks. He, there might be, but that's in, in investments, okay? Investments only. The money to invest. Yeah, there'll be banks, but they're going to be. It's always going to be a, a rolling thing. It's not to be saving, getting percentage of that. It's going to be getting a percentage of the investment of how much is being made. Boom, 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 boom. This world's going to get their years vacation. Pregnant. There's going to be free. The the, the, the service is going to give us all free daycare. Mothers are going to get one year's vacation, unlimited funds. So why would the whole, any family work work if they can, if they're getting unlimited funds? They don't have to work during the time she's pregnant. How many women aren't going to have children anymore? How many how many homosexuals, transvestites, and everything are going to waste their seed on? And every one of them is costing them a fortune that they that they throw away. No, they're gonna to want to have those kids. They're gonna be thank they're gonna be loving having kids. They're gonna be wanting to have to adopt kids. Everybody's gonna to wanna to have kids. Adopt them too. You can do anything you want. As long as you get uh, keep the lifeline going of your bloodline. You're not you're not involved with somebody else's bloodline. You understand that? Unless you get into that bloodline. So when we adopt a, a, a child. That we know that will enter our bloodline someday. Could enter our bloodline someday. The point of the matter is that what are we going to do with their, all those people that never had nothing? They never had nothing. They were lived under the worst conditions in the world. And all of a sudden, now they're living with the normal human beings. And all the riches in the world. You see what I'm saying? The Chinese didn't have children. Okay? They didn't have children. That doesn't mean they're not living. They're living in a spiritual world up there. There's, okay? But they can't have nobody to be physically born again in. Okay? They're waiting for children in the bloodlines to appear so they can be born again. Most of them giving up hope. The majority of them are giving them hope. But if we give them hope, the Chinese people have a lot of catching up to do by having kids. Give their ancestors and families a blood. Have them living again. Have those kids as many as you can. Donate. Those women can either donate their eggs if they can't have them, but whatever. The fathers can sit there and have a, God knows how many kids get that family growing. Get that family growing. Donate his sperm wherever it wants to go. Just as long as the family gets growing because those spiritual people have to have a place to get back to life. You can't enter the kingdom of the living lest you be born again. That doesn't make sense. So they have to get born again. When they get born again and they can live in life don't throw that opportunity away by killing somebody or killing yourself. That makes no sense at all. But it also makes sense. Don't live it. Starry. Playing. The government. God's coin is going to give everybody everything. And we can't, we can't save it either. We can't save God's coin. We got to invest it. So God's going to end up owning everything that's going on. Every business, every everything that's going on. But we want that. It's going to keep growing. All everybody's got to do is work. They'll care about if you, where you work at. We're not saying how much you got to make or nothing. You work. You're going to get your year's vacation. Pregnant mothers are going to get their year off. And who's going to be paying for that? That printed monopoly money that they printed, that's what it's it actually. Monopoly work money is going to be worth more. Why? Because somebody took time to, to make it nice. You know, um, the money that you, the, our countries use 
it's actually be worth blank paper. Even though they, just, they, they put ink on it and stuff and took some time to make it. But we're going to tell them to print it. We're going to tell you because that's what's going to keep the poor out of, uh, from, from, from living in, uh, homeless. That's going to keep the, the sick from being sick. That's going to keep the, um, the, the whole circle going. God's figured out everything. I didn't figure this out, people. This is not mine. This is what God told me. He didn't even tell me a God's coin but after I, uh, until after I read the mix. It was like a surprise. Oh, my God. I just wrote this, but I left that part out because you didn't know. I didn't know about it. And then recently, I was trying to get my book sold so I can get out the God's coin. People buy my book so I can get, get to God's coin. God says, don't do that. It's simple. I got what it takes for you to get the, the God's coin right now. It's all it is a prom promissory note. says, I owe you. God's living ministry owns you. When it goes in the market for $35,000, guess what? It's not staying there. Not one split second is not going to stay there. It's going to, it could go off the charts. And guess where Bitcoin is going to go? <laughs> if the ones that didn't trade the two for one. Example. Guess where all their other cryptocurrency is going? <laughs> Guess where the paper money's going to go? Guess where gold's going to go? Silver's going to go. They know it. That's why they'll trade it in for God's coin. Because they know God's coin's got... got it has 7 billion, almost 8 billion people to reach. You talk about me worried about getting my books out? I don't think so. That's what God made me wear. It's not about my books. It's not about the book. The book will get out there. That's how many people I convince to send in two cards. I mean, make out two cards and send me one. Physical cards. Put your fingerprint on it. Put your name on it. Put your birth date on it. Those are the three identifying cards are better than anything that they, they, they got today. Send it to me. And everybody you sponsor... You send me their card. They can give you the card to you. You add your fingerprint to their card. That's better. God just told me that. And send it to me with your fingerprint on it. Your sponsor. So you got their finger, two fingerprints on there. You got your fingerprint and you got their fingerprint. So they got a God's, another God's coin. Don't send me cards with so many boot fingerprints on there that we can't recognize them. You know what I'm saying? But I'm going to physically put those cards in a, in, in, in a locked place and make sure that they're never touched. And even if I didn't, it doesn't matter because the day that it, I'll take your word for it. Damn it. You understand what I'm saying? I had it, but they stole it. Guess what? Boom, take it. Here, I'm not stupid. God will tell me. He'll tell me. I need you to prove it to me, buddy. You know, he'll tell me whether to ask them that. But the otherwise, I'll probably just hand him a gospel. Why not? Don't cost me nothing. Now cost me a damn thing. You know what I'm saying? I gotta spend it anyway. I can't keep it, remember? Can't save it. The guy that invented Bitcoin. Let me tell you. Let me get it. Nakamoto uh, Sotashi Nakamoto. Okay? Hardly anybody that knows about this guy, but he put it on his experiment. He's put it on the market. At 0 0.009 cents, less than a penny, on the market to see what it'll do. Like I said, it's 2000, 22233 dollars today. Okay? What he started for less than a penny, 
God's going starting at thir maybe thirty-five thousand dollars at the latest at the at the at the beginning each. What can you do with thirty-five thousand dollars? What can you do with ten times that much, three hundred fifty thousand dollars? What can you do with ten times that, three million dollars? You gotta spend it. Are you gonna be living in the neighborhood you're gonna live in? Are you going to care more about living who you're living with and not your family? Your bloodlines. you got to preserve your bloodlines. That's who you're protecting. you got to protect your bloodlines. Yeah, we care about other people, but if everybody has an equal opportunity all through the world, there is no poor. There is no rich. We're all the same. It's all working like a clock. Believe me, if I have any extra, yeah, you think that the government is running in the red? I, I, I have to put up with that? No, I'll put them back. I'll give them as much as I can of my money. I have to spend it anyway. And keep them in the black. As much as I can for the vacations and all. You, I mean, do you see how it's going that God can shut down this world in a matter of days if he wanted to? A matter of, you know, months? I don't think it's going to take years. And this is not a secretive thing. When you call to join this ministry, oh, and you, I mean, you send the cards in. You, you, you can call if you want. I, I can give you a phone number, but this video, by how many uh, uh, how many cards I get, will kind of determine things. But if you make out these cards, I'll know what you're getting. And, I mean, it would help if you put a dollar on each card, because, I mean, it would be nice, because that just goes to the ministry to help things. Because, believe it right now, I, I, I'm, uh, I, I gotta pay my, uh, pay my property taxes. With my Social Security, I'm 70 years old, and I'm gonna. It's already. I got to the 26 before it goes on the auction block. So it's not like I got money. It's not like I'm trying to think. I'm. I've invested everything. I get give. Sent 122 copies of God's Message, my book, printed book, to Amazon. Put it to sell my website. Guess what happened? They were delivered by the, by the U.S. Post Office. I got the receipt for that. But they lost them. How'd they lose them? I can tell you, Amazon's either working for Satan or with Satan. Okay. They're part of the. They're part of that that situation. Hey, they, they they are in a loop, so big. So confusing, they don't know what the right hand from the left. That they can lose 122 books inventory, but they cannot. And the government, I couldn't get a 501c or a uh, nonprofit organization permit. Why? Because it says if you are political or have any intentions, you can't do it. Now, the Black Panther Party. Um, any crook, any organization, don't care which one, can can become nonprofit, but they have to declare they're not going to be political. They have to declare it. I won't. God's every intention is to bring down every government in this world. God's every intention is to bring down every religion in this world. Not to bring down this religion. They don't want God doesn't want nobody leaving their church. So stay there. Just gotta convince your pastor. Hey, if you want to stay your mind closed and, and feed us that BS and don't want to let God in here, you better read the read the Bible again. Is his story true or is yours? Who's telling the truth? He better open his mind because he's going to be up to the same questions that you have because you have a laptop, you have computers, you have 
libraries. You got places, and you got places to research and find out whether who's right and who's wrong. That's the point. I can tell you about Noah's Ark. Hell, it was found in 1910 by the Russians. Lieutenant Roskowitz doing reconnaissance photos over Turkey. He found it. He took aerial photographs of it. I, I get copies of it in my, my books. Blurry, but they're still, you can still make out the Noah's Ark. The thing about it is, they found it, they measured it, they spent eight years studying it, they took samples, everything else. But the world doesn't know anything about where it's at. Why? Because the Bolshevik Re Revolution happened during, uh, during that eight years that they were studying it. They hung the Tsar's head that, that, that ordered the expedition to go out. And they hung it on a flagpole. They took all the people that were in the Kremlin. The aristocrats, the teachers, the scholars, anybody with the education. And put them on the Kremlin fence. The most important ones on a Kremlin fence. Impaled them on the points of the fence. Impale means stuck them there alive on the points of the fence. And let that thing work its way through. Machiavelli kind of stuff. You see, the thing about it is, all this stuff has been buried beneath our noses. And we accept it as it never happened. Oh, you can look at, say the Holocaust never happened? BS. It happened. You can say Noah's Ark never existed. You can say that the Tower of Babel, God doesn't exist. The person that says that, you don't need to listen to because this is a complete person that they're God, they want to be God. They're trying to control you. And even God won't control you. God wants not, not going to get into that micromanaging. God will lets us, he wants an adventure. He's got to live through the adventures and fix our mistakes. And there's no mistake in his sight. He just has to adjust to whatever reality we chose. We could have gone in a million different directions, but he want, he's not sure which way we're going to go. But he'll adjust, to what, he'll adjust whatever has to go to work out his way. He can do that. He's God. Can the guy you're listening to do that? Can the God you're listening to do that? Could anything that we believe in do that? I don't even want the job. I can't, I will try to figure out somebody else's life, let alone my own. I wouldn't want God's job in a minute. I couldn't do it anyway. But he does it for each and every one of us. He lives, lives life for the adventure. You got to live forever. Come on, forever is a long, long time. If they were, say everybody did go to a heaven with a pearly case, and I, well, that'd be fine for the first thousand years, but a million years is, 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 is a trillion years is even short of that. That's not that. There's a lot more trillion years in heaven. How old would that get? Singing your gospel songs and your happiness. No, God made a better way. He put us immortal, living through our DNA. Through our children, through our offspring, not through somebody else's, not through uh, uh, birds, not through animals, unless we breed with them. Oh my God, that's that's a whole different story, and it's been done. They're just, scientists are doing it all the time. When you experiment, when you let them experiment with DNA, we let them continue experimenting with DNA and mixing animals. Or A and I with human beings. Get this. A and I or Satan have no interest in human beings. They live forever. They don't eat. They don't sleep. They don't care. They don't feel. Why would they give a damn about you? You don't they don't need pets either. Something they you know. So the thing about it is if we let these things, these people experiment, put chips in our minds. Oh, they had it figured out. I mean, 
that lieutenant, I mean that, that congresswoman from Connecticut. She even called it Bill 666. The implant, because of this COVID IV, uh, uh, IV, the implant, COVID IV people, and hate uh, racist people with the chip that, so they can deny them from going to the store, so they can deny them going to restaurants, so they can keep track of them. Because they didn't want COVID people going into restaurants. They didn't want people going into stores. They didn't want things, so they wanted to keep track of them. That's what she said. It's called Now, she numbered it 666. Why in the hell she do that if she wasn't a, a big fan of Satan? Okay? Now, she actually calls it Bill 66 because she, she, she wants to be one of the top people in the daggum category of Satanists, which is a man-made religion. Okay? You understand what I'm saying? They're dreaming if they think they're going to get any spiritual thing out of this, okay? Because they care less about them, okay? But, yeah, they want to be the one of the loyal followers of, of a big committee. But there's money in being Satanism, okay? So they fall them. And no importance. Puts people on that. But this congresswoman, she puts out a Bill 666 to track COVID people, make sure they don't get things. And, and racists, too. They want to know where these activists are going. And you can put this chip inside them. And Congress, <laughs> Congress allows it. Yeah, Congress allows it. They're, they're Democrats. God, God, God bless them. Huh? So they did it in Connecticut. Thank God they didn't do it to the whole country. Yeah, they kept people from going all the way around. What else did they put in that, that that chip? They didn't call it 666 for nothing. The plan was to, to, that eventually, if they had everybody with that, to keep people from going to stores, keep people from the, keep them, control people so they couldn't go out, couldn't spend their money, starve them, unless you did, stayed with the program. You see what I'm saying? That's why they called it 666, the mark of the beast. The rapture is not the mark of the beast. That's part of their BS in the Bible. Yeah. I'm not saying John Patmos wasn't on track of what he wrote. But he didn't know he's being manipulated. He didn't know who was actually telling the story. And some of the story might be true. You know why? Because the fact of the matter is, if we don't do anything, <clears throat> we could bring about the end of time. Because God has no choice. If we keep on our, our track and quit having children, and we want to extinct ourselves, he's going to have to start over. He's going to have to start over. Pick out a planet. Best one. Best candidate. Put an atmosphere around it. Put another Adam and Eve on it. Put more cattle. Maybe improve on everybody and everything. Maybe give them Maybe humans wings. You know? Whatever. I don't know. Whatever we we don't need to imagine what God would do. We gotta imagine what we can do. That's what I've already done and God's already done for us. Have children, spend money. <clears throat> May it become the hands, the voters for God, the mouth, the feet, the hands of God. If this video doesn't make sense and it doesn't go viral. It's not because I didn't make it and I didn't do my part. It's because they kept you from hearing it. And you might not ever see this picture. Because it can get buried. Just like everything that's important is buried in the internet. Way deep. Believe me. That's why I spend so many hours on the computer. 
you can't get down what you really need to know anymore because it's buried so deep the real stories you gotta you gotta rely on wikipedia you gotta rely on this stuff first you know this is not the, the top of the line this is not the truth's way deep like iceberg okay you're not even getting the tip of the iceberg not even flake of what's on top that's the point i'm gonna end this video because i think it came out pretty good upside but i could keep on going for hours because i got still still a lot to tell you in fact i might God's telling me, yeah, keep on going because you guys got nothing new. You guys can turn this video on and off as long as you want. But here's here's another thing that God's put on my mind. I'm going to tell you, tell, you, I'm going to tell you a story about Muhammad first. Muhammad, born 517 AD, okay? He was 49 years old when he... His religion had 360 gods. 360 gods because it's 360 days in the thing. I, I don't know if I've discussed that here or not. But believe it, there's 360 gods. It's just like 360 days a year. This 362, this 365 was added. It doesn't make sense in the calculations, okay? 360, 90 in a season, 90 in a season, 90 in a season, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees completes a circle. 360 degrees circle. 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees completes a square. 90 degrees completes a rectangle. That's why the year was in 360 degrees. When you add two years to that, and then five years, Caesar adds five years. Scientists decided two. You know? Now it's 365. Why not make it 367? It makes no difference what we keep on adding to the calendar. It makes no sense. But 360 absolutely makes sense. Those original calculations came from Jared's wife, Raka. Jared was an astronomer, a Chaldean. Chaldean was a name for astronomers. Their only son, Enoch. Their only son, Enoch, wrote two books. He described that angels took him to, to different heavens. And he wrote everything. He wrote about fallen angels and he wrote about the time. The 24 hours in a day, 12 hours in a, in a day, 12 hours in a night. 24 hours in a cycle, three, three, 30, 90 days in a, 30 days in a month, 90 days in a season. It's all, that's, the algebra was written by Enoch, not originated by Enoch. It was by his mother, Baraka. There, his father, Jared, spent 175 years making star charts, following the stars, everything, before he ever found a woman. And then when Baraka, seeing that she was a calculator, she goes, wow, just, she's amazed. She, oh, cow, this makes all sense. And she started doing the calculus. She found it down to the minute, 60, days, uh, 60 minutes an hour, 60, you know, 60 seconds in a minute. I mean, she was the calculus behind everything in this universe. You think we invented this stuff and we take credit for it? We didn't let's do squat. We're still using the same formulas that were brought to us from the... After Cain and Abel was Seth. And after Seth was Jared. That's how far we are from the three true people that we follow today watching our planets, watching our orbits. They were called, he called himself a Chaldean, which is now, that was the name for Chaldeans. Which would bring me back to Muhammad. Muhammad, at 49 years old, he, he was confused by 360 gods. What's the truth? Because he sees these people are brutal, brutal, brutal murderers. Very brutal murderers. They take any woman they want, anytime they want. 
they had to wrap themselves, even today, they had to wrap themselves all over. Because even if they claim that a man, she, she, she looked with a, at a glance at, at a man, she's, she's guilty of her own rape. So they cover their heads and toe and keep their heads bowed for a reason. Because they don't, they risk being raped. Just by them saying, they don't have to have proof. That just by them saying, she, they enticed her. She wiggled her butt a little bit. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, they are perverted religion. Every woman is fair game. Every grandmother, every child is just about fair game to them. Doesn't matter. They're fair game as long as they're female. Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be female with them. Okay, so they are like sick puppies. Okay? Muhammad seen enough of their junk. He went to a cave called Hira, and he prayed, and, he, he, and Gabriel came to him. The angel Gabriel, he said, told him, there's but one Allah, which is Allah means God. There's only one God, one Allah, one God. There's never been no more than one God, Allah. Doesn't mean there's two different gods, because one's Allah, one's God. They're both the same, just two different words for one same thing. The Hebrews got 77 different names for God. Okay? So don't, don't think that they're, they're, this is original. Okay? Yahweh. You know, whatever they want to call it. Okay? God is God. <clears throat> now, he got visited by this, and he went right back to Mecca. That's where Abraham was born. Goes right back to Mecca. And he says, there's but one God. There's but one Allah. People say, you talking about our gods? Just, they start stoning him. He has three boys by Khadijah. Muhammad married a, a woman that's 15 years older than him. She was a widow and she had already had a girl. But And she was rich, very wealthy. Muhammad married her. She's 15 years old. But, Muhammad loved her, and they had three children, three girls, and three boys. I mean, they had six children, three, three girls, and three boys. And they were all teenagers. Why do I know they were teenagers? Because they never had children. Okay? You know, people, when they get, get old enough, they're going to start having kids. So they were all young, especially the girls, what I'm saying. There was no lying. In here. Okay, so then... He goes there and he get. They start stoning him, saying, "Hey, don't talk about the gods. They're gonna kill you. This, oh, we're gonna kill you for saying so." So they they stone him. His little sons. They could have been teenagers. I doubt it. They come to his aid. They got stoned with him. By the time the Islamic got uh, uh, got, got to him, they were already dead. But then to make a point, they had to cut their heads off. They cut their heads off. In front of Muhammad. So he shut his mouth. Go home. Don't ever talk about this again. He stayed home. People came to his home. To find out about. What's the deal about Muhammad. The ones that, that were concerned. When he did. They knew it. Guess what they did. The Islamists. Who were Sunnis. They uh, they waited for a daughter to get mature. As soon as she got mature, they kidnapped her. They raped her. A Sunni leader raped her in front of Muhammad. Then he took her to have his children. Guess what he called himself? A Shiite. Yeah, they're, Shiites are connected by bloodline. By what? Rape? By kidnapping? By forcing somebody to have their children? That's nice. She ought to say thing. Yeah, they, they've got to be proud of themselves, huh? That's what she ought to They took all three daughters the same way. Rape them in front of Muhammad. Probably in front of Khadija. Keep, take them. 
to be their wife and make her have her children the rest of their life. That was sick. That's sick. Khadijah died broken hearted. I think it was November the 9th. 632 area AD. Something like that. Anyway. The day he. They killed. His wife died. Muhammad couldn't stand it no more. He said. Allah. He started turning over 300, tried turning over 360 statues, as many as he could. Allah! There's but one Allah. One God. There's only one God. I've had enough. You killed my wife. You killed my children. You just can't think, oh, you can't do nothing better or worse than me. There's but one God. Allah! Allah! Guess what? The Meccans did. They joined him. They started turning over the statues. They started turning and they started screaming, Allah! Guess what the military did? <laughs> what they normally do? Cut off heads. Yep. Muhammad escaped with 158 people. Meccans, they weren't followers now. You understand because he hadn't been a preacher. The Meccans knew that Muhammad suffered enough. They knew that he, they watched his children get uh, kidnapped, his girls. He knew they killed his sons. He had been enough and it's not right. They left. They, the Meccans had had enough. The Meccans, understand the word Meccans, had enough. They fled, but they couldn't stay in Arabia no more. There was bounty on every one of them's head to return Muhammad so he could recant. They wanted him to say, he is not, he made all this up. He, he didn't mean to start all this. They wanted, that's a recanting. It was, I made it all up. No. He didn't stay in Arabia. With those, with those Meccans. He got to Ethiopia. They give him refuge. The Ethiopians give him refuge. I'm going to tell you a story that you're not going to understand until you hear the whole story. But Cush was the beginning of Ethiopia. He's a black man. He sent, he sent his daughter, Malila, Malita, to marry I and mean, to meet Solomon to thank God for changing his language to Ethiopian and giving him his own identity, his new identity. He wanted to find God and thank him. Cush was a black man that his three sons, he told his three sons when he saw the, the star, our three sons, uh, they knew the ball of the star of Bethlehem. Three kings. One from the Sudan. One from Arabia. One from the Persian Gulf. They all followed the star to Bethlehem. They followed Jesus from the manger to the cross. They sent back. They had Ethiopians go, go see him. Like, it could have been on a monthly basis. Could have been on a yearly basis. I don't know. But they had them go and hear every word that God Jesus said from the time he was born you know on the manger to the cross and report back to them as they change places of course they would take people in similar identities and whatever hard to fit in but they they, they were spies all through Jesus life they, they knew as much as the apostles or more their bible is completely different it tells you what the Bible doesn't tell you. The Bible is kind of written by a man as hearsay. What they wrote is kind of like more like fact because it comes from actual people that saw and they heard and listened and came back to report what they saw, they heard and listened. It's kind of what the Bible, some of the Bible is. The reports of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the apostles that were with God, they wrote letters. That's, those are the real sources. You know what I'm saying? Everybody else is kind of like throw their opinion in there. Paul. Forget it. Anyway. The only thing about it is, is not all everything wrong in the Bible. That's why Jesus said it's all good for your own knowledge. You know, 
that you can figure, but figure it out. You got to separate, like, so you got to separate the word, okay? What's, what, what, what's, belongs or what, what's man? Man's manipulated all these books for his own benefit. I mean, I even, I don't probably talked about this already, so I'm ready to think, so I'm going to go, keep on the story about Muhammad. Muhammad stayed in Ethiopia for two years. But the first year, the Ethiopians were Christians and they were Hebrews. So they turn around and start telling him, he can't have but one wife. Oh no, that didn't go over big with them. They left their, their, their families and their wives. And they, had, they couldn't accept the fact that the man couldn't have more than one wife. And they also couldn't fact the fact that Jesus was calling himself. They 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 interpreted it like Jesus was calling himself God. He was the, or the son of God. The fact of the matter is, they God made a commandment with Moses. There shall be no other gods before me. You know what I'm saying? So it's contradictory. Like, you can't have any gods, but you're going to accept another god because he's my son. It do doesn't jive with these people. They're, they're looking at, at a literary sense. The, the ten, if Moses says in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. And then the Muslims kill. It doesn't make sense to them. They understood that. So, the, But they also got, they take the, it one more step further. It's that they believe enough, like I said, in God. That they, they won't drink alcohol and they can't even have a, a bad thought. A bad thought. Because God knows everything all together. It's like, wow. Look how many times they pray. If we prayed like they, like they did, my God, we, we probably wouldn't have half the trouble we are now. You know what I'm saying? But the thing about it is, you think every time they do this is tradition. But sometimes, I, I was in Iraq for two years and Believe me, these people will do it by themselves in the middle of nowhere. You know? They'll, 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 they'll pray three times a day. Maybe more. Whenever they want to. They they believe in God. And they are super... I mean, it's not like... Why would a person get down there in the middle of nowhere by himself, roll out a carpet and, and, and get down on his knees and, 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 and meditate? And it's called, well, always calling on the name of God. It makes no, there's there's no other way to know know it except for God's there. So, anyway, Muhammad. After the the, the trek came there in two years, and those guys started getting them to, to believe in polygamy. They gotta go. They're a bad influence here. They're trying to tell our people that they have more than one wife. Or look at other women. They're looking at my wife. No, no. They got to go. You can stay. You only had one wife. You don't ever see, uh, endorse them anyway. So they let Muhammad stay another year. Well, those other guys had to hide. Because there's a bounty on them. There's a bounty on their heads. They can't look, go looking for them. So they stayed hidden. Well, then finally one got captured a year later. Guess what? The Islamics took a few soldiers, maybe a dozen, took them to the Ethiopians said, and threw down his head and said, he told us who you're here. Well, the Ethiopians looked at him and said, he said, Muhammad's here. The Ethiopians looked at him and said, ask him again. He, he, we don't know nothing of who Muhammad is. Maybe he told you about this to throw you off track and he's somewhere over, over there. We don't know nothing about it. Ask him. They cut his head off. They couldn't ask him. They said if they ever find another, they'll be back with 10,000. Ethiopian says, bring it on. <laughs> That's typical of the Ethiopian right? So they say, bring it on. If you, 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 if you want to come with 10,000, you, you, uh, you, you know, whatever. And anyway, you understand what I'm saying. 
they weren't afraid of the Arabs and they still aren't. Anyway, the papers of every word I just told you, they have, the Ethiopians have it. Josh Gates just went up there and talked to the Holy Holies himself. Asked him about the Ark of the Covenant being in that building. So it's no, it's no big nose. It's right up there, the Ark of the Covenant. The Holy Holy says, yeah, it's in there. Guess what else is in there? Everything that was in Solomon's temple before Nebuchadnezzar burned it down. Army turned burned it down. It wasn't in there. Nothing was in there. It was all put in that, saved by Maleta, I think her name is. Anyway, it was the Queen of Sheba. And Solomon had it put with the ark in the Holy Holies. Guess what else is in there? Muhammad's papers. Muhammad's told the story of his children, his boys dying, his women's, his daughter getting raped, how his son died. He's the one that told them. That's how come they told it. They told the story and they'll tell you the same story. The Ethiopians will tell you the same story I'm telling you. Because he was there for two years. But when that happened, they threw that head down and Muhammad saw it and he said, after they left, with their threat saying they sent send back a 10,000 man army to get them next time, he said, not another man's going to die on my account. Not another person. I got to go. He was set out to go on his own, but they gave him a horse and provisions. And they kept two spies watching him from a distance because Muhammad was determined that nobody else would help he, he, he didn't want nobody else around him to lose their life and have nothing to do with him. They give him a horse and they get that. He made it to Medina. When he made it to Medina, which borders Jordan, he, uh, he made it to Medina. Anyway, he made it to Medina. He didn't go out of the house. He stayed in that house. He was like a Howard Hughes living in his own waste. He didn't go out. He hadn't eaten. He was he, he, He's dying on the floor. The Ethiopian spies had to finally get in, intervene. They went into the home to revive him and get him back fed and salty because he didn't go out. He stayed hidden. And every month, I guess or so, you know, they had to come back in and check and get him more provision. He wouldn't go out. He didn't build a mosque and start preaching uh, Allah, he didn't do that. He didn't do that. He knew what the cost of that was. You know, thousands of lives. He watched that that happen every time he mentioned Allah. He couldn't do that. It was just between him and God. He stayed that way for eight years. Uh, all, eight years altogether. It was two years in, two years in uh, Ethiopia and Anyway, they didn't know about he him get. Uh, they they didn't n know that he actually didn't go to Medina. Well, they did, but they I mean, they suspected. But here's what happened. They found one of the uh, somebody said there's a man living down there in Medina by himself. He hasn't been out of his house, and. People were wondering about him, and he might be the Muhammad you're looking for. But he's a strange man that doesn't come ever come out of his house, and they they even see people sometimes come in and help him, and then leave. So he they, they go there and they say it's Muhammad, like they're sure it's Muhammad. The the, the guys that say I will lead you there, uh, and he says lead us there. If it's right, you're going to give you all all the rewards, the riches. Well, he got there. He, uh, yeah, that's the house. and that, he's, he's in there. He's the guy you're looking for. Sure enough, it was Muhammad when they got there. An army of 10,000. They sent an army of 10,000 after one man. And they got Muhammad. The other guy got his reward. He got his head cut off. Why would they pay a man? They don't all live up to their... Their, their, their thing anyway. It's easier to kill them. They don't need any witnesses. 
because as soon as the general left with Muhammad with 1,000, 1,000 went back to Mecca with, with Muhammad to get him to recant and write the, the Quran. Like I said, the general says he can take it back to write the Quran and recant. It was all a joke. I just made this up. There's always no angel. There's no Allah. He just made it up, right? I'm going to write about it, okay? They needed Muhammad alive to say that. So the general took a thousand soldiers, I left nine thousand, to build a mosque, to build a town. There could only have been five hundred people in there, but you know what he did? He had to commit genocide on everybody in Medina. They probably kept the animals, but they committed genocide. Every person, child, everything there, every witness had to be gone. Every evidence. They couldn't have any evidence. And they built a mosque. And they said, Allah, Allah, you know. When say, so we, it was the army thing. That's where Muhammad supposedly got their army of 10,000. And a thousand went back to Mecca. When he went back to Mecca, he went back to Mecca. Guess what? When 10,000 Islamic soldiers, best trained Islamic soldiers, went after Muhammad. He left kind of Mecca kind of with 36,000 Meccans. 30, you know, whatever. And the Meccans weren't stupid. They, they watched so much stuff. They've been waiting for this opportunity. They already had the rebellion, but they've been keeping their mouth closed uh, for 10 years, for eight years. And now the opportunity is the whole army is gone except for a few. Hey, guess what? They didn't have a chance. The Meccans took it over. And they refused to call themselves Islamics. They called themselves Muslims. You understand? They called themselves Muslims. Why? Because they didn't want They said, we are not Mus uh, Islamists. We are Muslims. Why are we Muslims? Because we believe in Allah. We can finally say Allah, God. You understand? I'm not even a, a, a Muslim, but my God, I know the difference between a damn rapist and God. So Muslims have no, have everything to do with God, and, and some have everything to do with being rapists. They don't want to be associated with them. So that's why they call themselves Muslims. When the Muslims hear this, they know I'm telling the truth. They know it, I'm telling the truth. And the Muslims will hear this because it's going on YouTube. They took him back, and guess what that, that, the, the general did? He, he kind of suspected something might go wrong because he noticed something was different. He just smelt it in the air anyway. He's going to cover his bases. He's not stupid. So he rides up to Muhammad, tied to the horse, with his hands tied to the horse. He throws his cloak around it, and he unties his hands. He has his cloak around it, and then he prays him up front. Sure enough. What he thought might happen, happened. The guards, the look on lookout, were Meccans. They weren't soldiers, Islamic soldiers. They were Meccans. It's, Praise be to God. Praise be to Allah. It's Muhammad. Praise be to Allah. It's Muhammad. Allah's name could never be spoken in Mecca before that. But before they took it. Not before then. Before they could took it. So the whole place is saying, Allah, praise be to Allah, thank you. You know, they're saying, thank you to God. Thank you, God. Muhammad's okay. Muhammad's back. They open the doors. The general parades them in. Everything's hunky-dory. Even the soldiers know not to touch their weapons. They're outnumbered. 9,000 to 36,000. Uh, uh, 36, they know not to even draw. So they go under, go there. Like they're parading him in as they were, as if they were Muslims. They say, like the general say, yeah, we're joining you. We let Allah, you know, he's he's in, right? Here's your, here's your thing. We got him back for you. You know, he's smart. But they didn't know until Muhammad jumped off his damn horse. 
and started hugging people that he had untied his hands. And they started to draw the swords, and the Meccans took them, took them before they could even get their swords out. And then the Meccans chopped their heads off. 9,000 soldiers got their heads cut off. He drew their weapons, and 36,000 Meccans took those. When he, they reached the Kaaba, the general reached the Kaaba, the leader of the Islamic said, Praise be to Allah. <laughs> you know, he wouldn't have said that before then. He said, Praise be to Allah. It's Muhammad. You're okay. Oh, yeah. He hugs him. Right? Oh, praise be to Allah. You're okay. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> you know? Guess what? He wouldn't have said that if it had been the other way around. If they were still in control. But they weren't. Then, this guy's not stupid. This leader of the Islamists is not stupid. He says, I want to believe in your Allah. Praise be to your Allah if he's still alive. But we got to know more about him. Are we, are we bad because we don't know about this God that you're talking about? Can you write it, write it, for us to understand it, that we might believe in your Allah? Write, write your papers. Let us know all uh, about this angel that you say, told you, to write the whole thing. Oh, Muhammad, he, just, he, he buys into it, but he doesn't buy into it. Because Muhammad says, okay, I'll write it. But he introduces in his writing about Jesus, about Moses, about Abraham, about Adam and Eve. And he writes it in the Quran. In the in the Quran in Medina, I mean, it's different. The one in Mecca was written by Muhammad. The one in Medina that they wrote said that he Muhammad was gone for eight years after he had a rebellion, and he raised an army of ten thousand and he marched against Mecca and took it. And guess what? They thought what they were going to what they were going to do, commit genocide. On Mecca, so there wouldn't be no living souls, like they did in, in uh, Medina. But instead, it backfired. What they had written didn't have happen. So you can compare the two. Their Quran. Yes, and then they they wrote four more Qurans. Their last Quran included sh Sharia law. Sharia law didn't come till. 300, 400 years later. Uh, this is part of their deal. That's where a woman is, can be guilty of rape. If you even look at her wrong, sideways, or if they even claim it. Sharia law is, I mean, it's got, it has some good points. I'm not saying it didn't. Sharia law, you know, it, it helps the handicapped, it helps the widows, it helps the things. It, 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 there's points it makes, but it, you still can't justify rape. You can't uh, justify murder. You see what I'm saying? No matter how it is, the Catholic religion did that. The Catholic religion y used their religion, and they committed more genocides than in, in, and more murders than any all the religions combined. The Hebrews... They were murderers too. Joshua was a murderer. Not a hero. You know? The only time at any battle in the Old Testament was ever fought the Jericho where the people blew horns. Now that's reasonable. You let God uh, handle it. You know what I'm saying? It didn't have to be by murders. But even so, an e people kill people. It doesn't matter who's dead, what is the bad or the good or the bill is in bad or whatever it is. It's still human beings. They still have families. They still have future families. They had DNA. You can't kill. You can't kill. You can't justify murder for any reason. Not if you're in the military, not if it's an accident, not if you're a criminal. You can't justify murder um, 
uh, are killing for any reason. That's why in the in God's new world, it's kind of like if you murder you you get through through the justice process and they they come they're gonna even take an accidental person a person that does by accidents and hey uh, are you worth any more than that person that you just killed? Kind of they're gonna kind of be the judges on earth to say what you just did. Can you justify killing not just that human being, but all of his future human beings? And you spare your life because he he just lost God knows how many more is within himself. He just ended the possibility. So anytime there's somebody dies, even by accident, there has to be a justification. It's not an eye for an eye, two for two. It's an eye for not. It's, it's, it's an eye for God knows how many eyes that would have been lived. You know what I'm saying? So it's kind of like you can't justify killing even by accident. That's kind of like what God come back and give me this message after six thousand years. And he be, I think he, all my life it's proven the reason why I did because I'm not the best boat. I'm not going to say I'm not the best Moses. I'm not the best choice. Neither was Moses. Right? He says, he's my brother, Aaron. You know? He, said, he, he can speak. He doesn't stutter. Thing about it is, what I'm saying is, God, give me the message. That doesn't make me special. I'm not special. I'm not cursed either, but I'm not special. Because you're listening to this. You hear this. You're the one that it's made for. Here's the one that's special. You wouldn't get this message. You're not hearing this message because by coincidence. If you see in this message, you read this message, you hear this message or anything, it didn't get to you by coincidence. There is no coincidence in the world. There's, there's nothing mystical about this stuff. You heard about it because you was led to hear it. You got it by, by iPhone. You got it by TV. Well, where the heck did the iPhone come from? Where did the TVs come from? Where did the 5G that got it there come from? Come on. It took us. We got to understand. It's not rocket science here. These messages. I, I'm just the one that's got, I guess, the stupidity not to quit. I won't shut up. Like a lot of autistic kids, we don't shut our mouths. That's why, that's why the world kind of doesn't like us. Okay? When we get on a roll, we get on a roll. And we won't give up. And we don't tell lies. We might seem like we're telling lies because of the way our stories go. At least we, to our minds, we justify the way we see it. Both that we're storytellers. We tell the stories the way we took it. But if you can't prove it wrong, who am I going to believe? I didn't make it up. I was given it. I researched it. I looked at it. I didn't find evidence against it. So who am I going to believe? I'll believe my version. I'll believe God's version. I'll believe God's the one that told me. I don't want to take credit for it. I don't want to be God. I wouldn't have God's thing. I'm not telling nobody not to smoke, drink, do whatever you got to do. I'm not saying that. I'm telling you, have kid children. And think uh, and honor God by being in the hands and feet and mouth of God. In other words, don't let people stop tell you having kids is bad or try to talk you into some kind of deviant lifestyle. Uh, be the voters. Vote these daggum self-interest groups, these 